to switch this on. Yeah. All right, try it now. Okay. And this remote's a little different. Yeah, this is forwards, backwards, and then right here's the laser uh, pointer. Okay. <clears throat> Well, I'm glad to be here today. I almost didn't make it. Uh, it took me three hours to get a tractor started to, to feed cattle this morning. And uh, I understand last night our president said that uh, the debate about climate change is over. Um, I think we all know the climate changes. Uh, climate change has become a euphemism for global warming. And I guess if you live in the White House, you might think there's global warming, but if you live in my house, you might think differently. <laughs> so, this is our farm. <clears throat> We're in Craig County, uh, about 30 miles from Blacksburg and 30 miles from Roanoke. <laughs> Excuse me, we're in a, in a high mountain valley, um, and uh, it's a beautiful place. Um, Craig County doesn't have a, a stoplight or a 7-Eleven store, so that's why I moved there. It's a very quiet, rural place. And um, I fed my first hay this season last week. And the reason I fed my first, first bale last week was because I joined the Forge Council and came to a, a winter conference here 20 years ago and I learned how to stockpile forages and how to produce forages and how to graze forages. And I learned all that through this forage council. Uh, it was, it's my fundamental resource. Uh, I had an opportunity to, uh, to work with Harlan White and Paul Peterson and uh, Ray Smith, uh, and I learned a great deal from them, and I went to a, a grazing school that the Forage Council put on. Uh, <clears throat> it's been a, a most precious resource to me, so I would I'd strongly recommend that uh, if you're not a member that you consider joining. Uh, really, I think uh, you need the Forage Council, and I think the Forage Council needs you. Uh, so, <clears throat> uh, we did a, a uh, a little farm test on my, on my farm uh, with Paul Peterson on uh, frost seeding lagoons. And uh, it, it was one of those typical farm tests. It didn't work out very well. Uh, we had a, a good germination from our frost seeding, and then it turned dry. And those little, those little seedlings that we had come up just didn't have enough of a root system to make it through the dry, the dry period. Uh, but I learned a lot. And it's when I first started uh, in some kind of a rotational grazing system. Uh, I had some temporary water trough. I had a temporary water trough and some temporary water lines and uh, some uh, portable electric fences. And I was uh, I was moving uh, moving a battery charger, a portable battery charger, around and driving grain rods in the ground and whatnot. You know. And I liked what happened, but I didn't like the having to move all the time. And uh, realized, you know, that was um, from that experience, it was good to go into a, a more permanent system. Uh, did a uh, a test with Ray Smith, uh, and uh, it was looking at. Uh, I think that the primary primary thing was was for the uh, the white clovers, Patriot and Durana. Uh, and at that time, they didn't have a name. They were just uh, had, a, had a code identification. But we planted those on my farm and, and monitored those for a couple of years. And again, I learned an awful lot from that. So it was a great experience. Um, let's see if I can work this here. This is, uh, this is our farm. Um, you can see uh, it's uh, got a little elevation to it. Uh, down here, it's about 2,500 feet elevation, and up top, it's about 3,600 feet. Um, <clears throat> my farm had been neglected for 50 years before I bought it, which is probably the main reason I was able to afford it. Uh, it was grown up. I had, uh, I had locust trees and, and cherry trees on the, uh, on the hay fields. Uh, the whole uh, upper area here, 
uh, was covered in uh, uh, hawthorns. And uh, so I had a, I had a real challenge. I've, I've been here 32 years and uh, working on it for 32 years. Uh, I was fortunate to, uh, to, to buy this farm because everything I did had to make an improvement. So you know, it was easy to, easy to be improving all the time. Um, I've got about 90 acres of cleared land and 200 acres total. And with 90 acres of cleared land, you can only have a limited amount of uh, livestock. Um, so I real, realizing that, um, and when I started, I knew nothing about raising cattle, uh, which is in itself not a bad thing. I didn't have a whole lot of, uh, this is the way we used to do it. You know, so I was open to new ideas and new, new, learn, new things to learn. And um, I started renting land. And if you're a newcomer to an area, you don't get to rent the aunt's land or the uncle's land. You get to rent the land that doesn't have any fences on it. And so that's what I was doing, was building fence on other people's property. And um, Sunday morning when I was getting ready to go to church, I'd get a phone call and, and find out that the people that I was renting their land had left the gate open and my cattle were down the highway. And, uh, and after I'd also, also after a couple of years after I'd built fences, they decided, well, they didn't want to rent the land anymore. Uh, so I got a little upset with that and, and uh, realized, you know, if I, if I was going to farm, it's going to be on this place right here. And I was going to spend all my effort and all my time on this place and make it as productive as possible. And uh, that's what I tried to do. <clears throat> um, there are a lot of things you can do if you have a little uh, imagination and incentive. Um, I had a little, a little spring and a hollow up, almost halfway up the mountain that I found um, shortly after I bought the place. And uh, um, when I built, built my home here, I put in a, a spring system for it, which had been used for this old house here. Uh, but the little spring up on the mountain uh, was just a trickle, and I never thought it was any, any value. Uh, but when I grazed my cattle, uh, you can kind of see here, it's kind of spread out. and. Uh, this area up in here would not be grazed real well because it was a long ways for water. And uh, so I'd have overgrazing down in here and undergrazing up in here. And uh, so I went up and uh, with a, this was inaccessible to equipment, to any machinery. I went up with a hoe and a shovel and a bucket of, of, uh, of stone and dug out that little spring, put a pipe in. And that little pipeline runs 1,200 feet on top of the ground through the woods, through the trees, and um, runs down to a trough up top here. And um, I was surprised at how, uh, how much water you can collect from a little, a little stream of water in 24 hours. And I, put a, I put a tire trough up top, which holds about 800 gallons of water. And even though there's just a little bit of water coming in, you collect it for 24 hours and you've got enough for a lot of cattle. And um, so that worked, uh, worked for me. Um, January the 7th, we were 10 below zero. And the warmest it got that day was minus one. And that 1,200 foot pipeline on top of the ground continued to run through that period. It has not frozen up. Uh, so it, it's been a, a valuable resource, and, and now I go from here down to a dozen tire troughs, uh, one cascades to the other one, the overflow from the first one goes down to the second one, and the second one to the third, and the third to the fourth, and so forth, all the way down to the, uh, to the, to the uh, meadows down the bottom. <coughs> This shows you a little bit about the, uh, the hawthorns. Whoops. Um, I'm not sure if you know very much about the hawthorns, but they have about a two-inch spike on them. 
and uh, it has a poison. If it, if it uh, penetrates your skin, it'll swell up and get aggravated, uh, and these things grow right down to the ground. I started with a chainsaw, and I found that that didn't work very well, and uh, I bought a little used uh, D4 caterpillar. I never had been on a caterpillar before, those are before, and uh, I decided I think I'll start on the level ground first before I get to those hills, and uh, I learned how to use that and, and push these things up. And uh, guess what happened after I pushed all those things up? Then I had, I, I didn't have a sprouting problem, but when I pushed them all up, I had um, pope berries, blackberries, all kinds of other things that came back up. And so I had to go back and get all of that out. And after I got all cleaned all that up, guess what came in then? Roses came in then. And I, I've, gone, I've, I've gone enough, you know, roses are not going to take this place over. And I had to go back, you know, by hand and, and get the roses out, I got that out. Um, this shows uh, a little bit of the, of the uh, system I have. Um, <clears throat> I know my farm by, by working in it, and about 15 years ago is when I put a, a control grazing system in, an intensive grazing system. And I know the farm, and I know what areas grow, uh, and what kind of forage I can produce on those areas. So I, I knew from the forage council experience and everything I could read uh, to how to lay out a system. And so I laid my own system out. And uh, I did not get any cost shares on my system. Uh, I guess I'm kind of independent. I like to do things my way and lay it out and do it my way. And, and so I did. Uh, I got, uh, as I said, a, a dozen uh, heavy equipment tires and, uh, and put those in and uh, lay it out. Uh, this is boundary lines, but I've also got permanent fences along here. And uh, the red lines are uh, paddock fences, which are just a single wire, a single high tensile wire. Uh, I've got a corridor here that runs up and gives me access to my paddocks so that I can get down, if I have an animal problem, I can get down into my, into my barn here easily. And I, I'm sorry, I couldn't. How large are the paddocks there? Approximately three acres. Um, I have 22 paddocks. Uh, set up here. I'm not sure that shows 22. It doesn't show 22, but I've got 22 paddocks. Um, I was thinking about it um, yesterday, and uh, by the time I end up and get through a grazing season, I'll probably have them on a, my animals on a hundred different places. So I'll, I'll have, in, this, in essence, a hundred paddocks. And I move every day. Um, I have a stocker operation. I buy calves in October that are unweaned calves, and I keep them until the next August. And uh, um, so that's my operation. We, we have about 100, as I said, uh, uh, 90 acres of open land. I have 100, 100 calves that I run on that. And uh, when I'm, I will. Um, cut these meadows down here, or most of them, or cut those in the, in the uh, spring. Um, and after I cut them, uh, I'll usually, uh, on some of them at least, I'll put uh, about 75 pounds of urea, 75 pounds of nitrogen in urea, uh, and, and graze those off after that. Uh, if I do it early enough, as usually there's good, good moisture and good temperature, uh, and I'll get a good regrowth. But <clears throat> when I do that, I'll come in, for an example, I'll come in and put a temporary fence across like this, and I'll set it out um, so that I have only three days of grazing in that area. 
And uh, I guess there was a mention earlier um, about uh, measuring the forage you have. Um, the way I measure my forage quality is um, I know how many animals I've got, and I know approximately what they weigh, and I know they'll eat about 3% of their body weight. So I can tell how much forage I got by that. And uh, I'll come in and put a fence in here that'll make uh, about three days worth of grazing. And I'll, I'll put that fence in, and then I'll put a fence across here and split that up three ways. <clears throat> and I'll put a, a water, temporary water trough here, and um, I'll move them through those three days. And the idea, <clears throat> the idea is that they're off of that in three days after they started on it, so they won't be eating any regrowth. And then I'll come in and, and leave that fence in, and I'll put another fence in. And um, I'll move all the way down this field. A couple of years ago, uh, I got in and got that field cut the third week in May <clears throat> and got fertilizer, uh, urea down on it real quickly, and I got a rain on it. And uh, this is about 17 acres here, and that 17 acres uh, gave me 30 days of grazing after that. Uh, my grazing plan, uh, of course, I start off in these, in these paddocks here up on, this, up on the hillside, and um, I'll start grazing as soon as there's forage. Um, and I'll graze through these, and, and uh, this will be the last part of April is when I'll start grazing. And the forage will be growing pretty rapidly then. And, uh, uh, so I'll rotate, it'll be maybe 10 days and I'll be rotating again through there, uh, 10 days, two weeks. And uh, as, a, as it becomes more forage, it'll slow down a little bit, and, and, uh, but, but it's recovering very quickly at that time of year. Um, I graze very, very hard in the spring, um, and my, my idea for that is uh, I suppose a lot of people would say I'm overgrazing, but I want to get the immature seed heads removed. Uh, I don't like to come back in and clip, and uh, I like to get those, get those seed heads. And I also like to um, cut the canopy down so I get light in for my, for my lagoons and uh, really uh, kind of depress the grasses and, uh, and favor the lagoons by doing that. And, Really, what I try to do by the end of May, I try to, to have no forage up here. The forage will be gone. And so then the, then the question is, well, if you've got no forage, <laughs> what do you do then? And what I'll do is I'll save a little part of the hay field down here, and uh, I'll never cut on that, that area, and I'll graze that. And again, you know, I'll, I'll strip graze that with a portable fence, and... Um, and come across and separate it uh, in, uh, in one-day one day parcels. Uh, and they'll never be in the same area over, over three days. Uh, <clears throat> this is a, an example of a, of a meta field uh, that I'm in the spring that I'm probably getting ready to cut. Uh, you can see there's various different, uh, different things growing. Mainly I have um, orchard grass. Uh, you can see I've got some alfalfa in here and, and uh, some dandelions and uh, a lot of different forward forbs. Um, but I will, uh, again, I'll cut that as early as I can. and. Uh, Part of it, I'll, I'll put urea on to, to stimulate the growth. This is an example of, um, uh, of the tight grazing. Um, and I'll, one of the things that, that I find I like the most about intensive grazing is that I can recycle the nutrients I think it's been six or eight years since I've used any commercial fertilizer other than a little urea in the spring. Uh, I have used poultry litter four, four times. I like poultry litter. 
but I found I can um, recycle the nutrients, put them right back where they came from in most cases. I do that when I'm grazing. I, I try to keep them in a tight spot. So I put the, put the, the uh, nutrients right back where they came from. Um, when I'm feeding hay, I will feed hay back on the fields that it came from uh, until about March. And then I'll go back and I'll, uh, I'll get them off the, off the uh, meadows in March. And I'll move up to the, um, to the paddocks. And I'll pick out an area in the paddocks that hasn't been producing as well. And I'll feed hay in those areas to, to supplement the nutrients back in those areas. Um, this shows you a little, a little example of my, my fences here. Um, <clears throat> one thing that I've noticed that uh, I like is, you know, cattle like to uh, congregate in corners. Uh, they just feel more comfortable there, I guess, and they'll spend the night in the corner. Uh, I can create corners all over my farm with this kind of fencing. And uh, so they'll, they'll sleep over right over in this corner, and that's where a, a good bit of my nutrients will be recycled. <clears throat> this shows an example of my, my paddock fences. Uh, here it is here. And uh, this is a, uh, a single 12 and a half gauge high tensile wire and uh, a little screw-in ring insulator here. Uh, and that's, uh, you can see the fences back along here uh, and here. Um, this, is, this is my uh, paddock fencing. Um, it's pretty simple, it's inexpensive. Uh, I use, uh, I have locusts on the farm. I use locusts for my fence post. The, the things I cut that won't make a fence post is sitting right here. They're too short, they're crooked, they're not, they're not good, so I'll use those. Uh, and um, you can also see here uh, some strips here. That's where I rolled hay the year before. And uh, this is a pretty steep hill. You really can't get equipment on it. So to, to, uh, to fertilize it, I've, I've rolled hay bales out up here to, to fertilize that. <clears throat> As you can see, I have a lot of dandelions. I uh, didn't plant those, but uh, I like them uh, because the cattle like them. Uh, this is fairly typical in the spring to, to see uh, this quantity of, of uh, dandelion blooms. Uh, and um, 30 minutes after I, after I turn into this, every one of those will be gone. That's the first thing they'll consume. This shows you another um, trough here. There's one up top of the hill, and there's one here, and there's one here, and there's one on down the hill. And um, those, those troughs are located with access to four different paddocks. Uh, so so I, can, I can water four different paddocks from one trough. And this shows a, this shows a tire trough. Um, <coughs> <clears throat> These are heavy equipment tires. Um, again, they were they were free. Um, bought those, and and uh, one of them I have the the one I was mentioning that was up top of the hill is was so big I could hardly lift it up with the tractor, uh, but I managed to move it around, and um, ran the my wife and I ran plumbing in the bottom of the trough and then poured concrete in it. I uh, I uh, used a chainsaw to cut the top out. And um, this is a two and a half inch PVC pipe. Uh, this is my, my version of a strainer. Uh, cattle will always end up dropping some uh, stems and, and grass in the, in the water trough. I don't want to get it plugged up. Uh, so I have this over, over my uh, discharge point and uh, I've drilled holes in it so that it keeps the trash out of it. This, 
this shows the spring gate, and um, uh, the spring gates work well on, on the on the areas of, around the uh, the water troughs where I have uh, four paddocks. I have three spring gates, so one paddock is always open, and to move from one to the other, I just move a spring gate, and it's that it's that simple. This shows a little bit of my, a uh, little better view of my um, temporary fencing. Uh, this is a um, half an inch tape. Uh, I like tape, electric tape rather than twine. Uh, the tape flutters in the wind and a little more visible to the deer. I have a little less deer problem with the, with the tape. Um, I like, this is a 3 8 inch fiberglass, four foot fiberglass post. Uh, with a stainless steel clip on it, and it has a little foot uh, step in. Uh, I like those uh, portable, portable fence posts because they're small. Uh, they're not awkward and clumsy like some of the heavier ones. Uh, I, can, I can pick 20 of those up in one hand and uh, pick them up and take them out to where I want to put them. And uh, I can lay a 800-foot a, uh, Temporary fence I in 10 minutes, and uh, I'm ready to go. Uh, one thing I, I neglected to mention earlier, uh, my, my boundary fence, line fence, is over here. Uh, one of the things I, I did when I went into the intensive grazing is I, I installed a 110-volt fence charger in my barn, and that, I hooked up a, a high-tensile wire off my woven wire fences all around the perimeter of the farm. And so anywhere I want to pick up a, a hot, hot wire, all I've got to do is tap into that fence. And I've got a hot wire, I don't have to worry about, worry about that. And I keep about 8,000 volts on it, so they know that the fence works. Let's see. This is a little uh, video we made last, uh, last summer of a move. This is right in back of our home. Oh, we got sand today. Sorry, I hit the wrong button. I stopped it, didn't I? You can see over here I have overgrazed. Um, again, this is in the spring, and I did that um, to, to favor the legumes and to get those in, immature seed heads grazed off. Um, if I graze off those immature seed heads, everything the rest of the season will be vegetative growth, and that's what I want to graze is vegetative growth. Uh, with, with these stalkers, I need to, I need to put weight on them. And uh, we, uh, we did a test uh, one year with uh, D. Whittier from, uh, from the Virginia Tech uh, vet school uh, on worm study. And, um, on a 40-day period, we weighed them at the beginning of the, every one of them at the beginning of the test and every one at the end of the test. And that was from the 1st of June to the middle of July, and they gained two and a half pounds a day. So I thought that was a pretty good gain for that period of the year. Uh, as, you could, as you could see, they, uh, they're not too bashful about moving. Um, 
I did have a few at the end of this little bit that were a little reluctant to move, but you know, they were, they're all female, so you can't tell that, you know. Sorry, ladies. Um, this is a little view of, of one, of the, one of the meadows before it was cut. Um, and I frost seeded uh, alfalfa in this field um, about 10, 11 years ago. Um, frost seeded alfalfa is not recommended. Uh, I, do, I do like to read and study and follow guidelines, but I like to try different things too. And I, and I, I wanted to try frost seeding some alfalfa. This particular time it worked. Uh, this alfalfa is still here, and uh, after 10, 11 years, it's still there. Uh, sometimes on a dry season in July and August, the only thing that's growing out in this field is that alfalfa. Um, so uh, I, like, I like the alfalfa uh, much better than clover because it does last. And uh, it's, not a, it's not what you'd call a full stand, but it does augment. Uh, it does augment, provide, provide grazing as well as, uh, as, well as nitrogen. Uh, it's a little bit of vetch down here. I'll have to get one of the experts to tell me whether that's a, uh, which one of the vetches that is. But um, about 25 years ago, I got some shale off my neighbor's uh, ditch bank by the road and um, put it on my driveway. And uh, the state had planted vetch some years back along that stretch, and that's where this vetch came from. Uh, it, uh, it gets thicker every year, uh, so it's, uh, it's coming in, but uh, the cattle like it, and so do I. I have, uh, when we did the, the um, test with Ray Smith, we did drill some alfalfa in. And it's still there as well. Uh, I like it. I've got a stand, stand of that on three acres. And I like it. Uh, the deer like it also. And they usually graze it before I can get to it. So I, I have to admit that um, drilling the, the alfalfa in is probably a better idea than frost seeding. But I have frost seeded. And I'll do it again. I'm going to do it this year. Um, Speaking of thinking of frost seeding, uh, my experience is some years work well for frost seeding and some years don't. Uh, so my, my program is frost seed every year about half the quantity and you increase your chances for having a good year. And this kind of shows a little bit of what it looks like before, during, and after a grazing period. Um, as I said earlier, uh, stockpiling has been, has been great for me. It's one of the greatest improvements I've made. I used to start feeding hay in November, and now I can get to uh, about this time of year. And uh, the reason I don't go further is because I've got orchard grass. And when I started doing this, the, the, the common... Uh, information was you couldn't stockpile orchard grass. Well, you can stockpile orchard grass. It just kind of disappears on you in January. I've not been able to, it just doesn't last into February. Uh, fescue will last longer, but, but orchard grass won't. Um, but you can stockpile it. Um, I had this, um, I had my, my stockpile forage this year uh, checked uh, the 9th of uh, January and it tested uh, TDN was 61 and the protein was 13. I can't make hay that good. I can try, I've, I've tried, but I can't make it that good. You can see, um, uh, wrong button again. You can see the cattle are back here. Uh, this is one of my paddocks, but I've cut them off uh, to this area and uh, like I say, I move them every day. And um, this shows areas here with the snow where I have not grazed them yet for the stockpile. Um, 
you know, I mentioned to a group one time about uh, moving them uh, every day when, I, when I'm feeding them stockpile, and they said, you know, isn't, isn't a frozen ground hard? Can you, can you step post in and frozen ground? And um, I stepped post in uh, last week with a, with a six inch snow cover, and the ground was nice and soft underneath that six inch ground, uh, ground cover. Uh, wasn't, wasn't a problem to step it in. Uh, but I have cut my, I've cut my hay consumption in half. So now I'm able to, to cut hay on part of these meadows and um, the other part I can, I can graze. Um, and that's opened up a, a, lot of, a lot of help for me. And this shows a little um, stockpile in, in December in the snow. Um, People, people say, well, it's snow on the ground. You can't, you can't graze stockpile. If the snow hadn't crusted over, if it hadn't iced over on top, um, my philosophy is if the, if the deer can graze it, my cattle can graze it. Um, the cattle uh, work for me. I don't work for them. And uh, I like to, like to keep them going. Uh, when it does crust over, I get out and roll, unroll hay for them, and as soon as the, the crust is down, I'll, I'll put them back on, on stockpile. This shows a little bit of the, uh, a little bit of the canopy here, and this is some worm casings, and there's some uh, aftermath and earthworms. Um, I was out um, sometime a few years ago with a Coleman lantern at night, and I was just drag, just hang, hanging the Coleman lantern off my off my arm. It was about knee height, and as it as it shone up above uh, me where I was walking, uh, 15 feet or so, um, it would highlight the worms on top of the ground in the spring, and the light would hit them, and they'd all disappear. But I think there were more. There was more animal uh, weight in worms than it was in cattle in that place. They were everywhere. I think uh, my carrying capacity is about doubled. Um, you know, um, thinking about um, thinking about this talk and and what I do and moving cattle and, and um, I've, I have moved cattle as much as four times a day uh, when I was uh, doing what's called mob grazing. I've done some of that and I, I was moving them four times a day. Now uh, I don't do that but uh, I do try to move them every day and, and uh, you really don't have to move every day. Um, um, I like to see my cattle I like to monitor them. I like to get out. Uh, that's how I keep my girlish figure climbing these hills, moving cattle every day. Uh, it's a benefit. Some folks go to a gym and lift weights, and some people run in the city and cars run over them and stuff. I'm, I'm productive with my exercise, and I can't tell you what it feels like to go out in the morning and... Um, just look over that valley and see the sun rising. Uh, that's not work. That's a benefit. Uh, so I really, really enjoyed this. I really like intensive grazing. Uh, you know, there are times uh, that you have to accept what Mother Nature brings you, but I like to be proactive rather than reactive and uh, be a part of it. Uh, we have those years that are dry. I guess that's when my uh, spirits get the lowest. Uh, you're sitting there, you know, and there's not a whole lot you can do except pray for rain, which is what I'm doing. Uh, but I'll have a little excess uh, spring water, and uh, I'll put I'll put a, a a sprinkler out in my hayfield, and I'll sprinkle, and I can 
I can grow an acre worth of, of grass. It's not, not going to make a real difference, but it makes me feel better. And it's worth it for that. I think that's the last one. Um, these girls keep my fence clean. She weighs about 800 pounds. She's on her knees. She is a good three, three feet on the other side of that fence. They know where that wire is, and it'll touch the hair and not shock them, but that's as far as they'll push. Um, I was mentioning earlier, I have mob grazed. I had a, I had a field out front uh, one year, and I had a, a stream flowing diagonally across it. It was flowing diagonally across it, and so it just didn't make any sense to try to cut hay on it, and I just left it. And finally, um, in July, uh, the forage was up, head high, six, at least six feet. And uh, I thought, well, what am I going to do with it now? This was before I ever heard the word mob grazing. I decided to, uh, decided to graze it. And I went out with temporary fencing and ran through there. And I've seen people, um, they'll, they'll cut a clip, they'll clip a place and put a fence in where they clipped it. Well, I just walked through it and put a fence in. And it was so thick, it was all I could do to walk through it. And I put electric fence in there, and I couldn't find the fence after I'd put it in, but the cattle, the cattle never crossed that fence. I never had one animal get out from where I was grazing them. Uh, they knew where that fence was, and they would not cross it. Uh, and they, um, they grazed the good part of that forage and trampled in the other part of that forage. Uh, the thing I didn't like about it was um, these are stalkers and they weren't putting the weight on I won't, really wanted them to put uh, when I was grazing that, uh, that uh, mob grazing and uh, the tall stuff. And, and I've done it once. I did it summer before last. and. Um, I've got some weeds in that hay field after I did that that I never had before, and uh, I'm not real happy with those, some of those weeds I got. So uh, I think for me, it just doesn't work, but uh, most, every, most other things I've tried have worked. There's a lot of talk these days about sustainability. Um, I don't believe in sustainability. I believe we should go beyond that. If we're not improving, we're going backwards. Uh, I can honestly say my farm's better every year than it has the year before, and that's my goal. And, uh, you know, um, I've realized I don't own that farm. Nobody owns land. We just, we just have use of it for a short period of time. And if I can't leave it better than I found it, I haven't, I've failed. So I, I want to go beyond sustainability. Are there any questions I can answer today? That 1200, I run my water lines 1200 foot above ground in the woods. There's no way I can bury it in the woods. <clears throat> Excuse me. After I get out of the woods, I took a chisel plow and I ran the chisel plow down where I wanted the line to run three times. Each, after each time, I had to dig out rocks because <laughs> I got a few rocks in the ground. And the third, the third time, I could put a pipe in. And it sits in the ground about six or eight inches in the ground. But never, never freezes? No. Never freezes as long as it flows. There, there's a lot of fall. Um, Probably six or eight hundred feet total. 
Um, let's see if I can. Can I go back to that? Um, <clears throat> that spring up here is about um, 3,000 feet elevation, so it's probably down to, down to this trough, that's probably about 2,500 feet, so it's probably 500 feet difference between those two extremes. Um, These troughs, it depends on between which one. Some of them are steeper than others. Um, it, that's an interesting point. Uh, this is the last trough, and um, it's out here on this meadow, and um, there's not really enough drop between here and here to drive the water. And so what I do when I want to feed this trough is I bypass this trough. In other words, I hook the, I hook the inlet, to that, uh, inlet to that trough to the outlet to that trough, which bypasses that trough. And so I have a gradient from this trough to that trough. And that drives it over. I would, I'd be better off if I fed grain to my animals, but I do not. Um, it's just a lot more pleasant. If I, if I start feeding grain, uh, they get nasty. You walk around with a bucket and they'll knock you down. Uh, so I would, I'd get more gain in the wintertime. Uh, I don't try to put weight, up, weight gain in the wintertime. Um, I rough them through the winter. They may, maybe make a half a pound a day, and I get com com compensatory gains in the spring. That's when I get my gains. Most of my most of my forage is orchard. Most of my grass is orchard grass. I have quite a bit of quack grass, and I've got fescue coming in. Any other questions? The, uh, the question was, do the, the cattle go up and down the hills? Uh, they do now. They have to. <laughs> uh, that was a problem before. Um, they, um, uh, the, the paddocks now are, are small enough, and they'll, they do cover them. They like, to, they like to walk along a hillside, but they'll cover up and down. I use fiberglass post, and um, um, I bought some that were that were sun guard protection, so they won't splinter. But they're more expensive, and frankly, I have arthritis in my hands. I wear gloves all the time, and so that doesn't bother me, but you have to wear gloves on those fiberglass posts. But I can pick up 20 of those and go right across the field, which is why I like them. They're small and they're light. All right, let's thank JC for that wonderful question.